Hello, and welcome to Galen Data's Medical Device Connectivity Innovation Webinar Series. My name is Keith Drake, Vice President of Business Development for Galen Data. Our topic today is AI, Analytics and Machine Learning to Enhance Digital Health. We'll be discussing how the intersection of biology and computational technology creates opportunity for exponential innovation for medical device companies. With me today is Angela Holmes, the Chief Operating Officer of Mercury Data Science. Angela is an AI strategist creating solutions to solve high impact challenges in high stakes industries. She has 15 years of experience working with venture backed and high growth Fortune 500 organizations in healthcare, life sciences, energy, and financial services. She received a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology and a Master of Science in Biomedical Engineering from the Johns Hopkins University. Angela, welcome. Thank you, Keith. Before we uh, dive into our topic today, I'd like to go over some webinar logistics. You can submit your questions for the Q&A session at any time in the panel on the right of your screen in the console. If we don't get to your question during the Q&A session, we'll follow up with you after the webinar. Uh, there's a handout section as well. You can download uh, handouts overviewing Galen Data, Mercury Data Science, and our Galen Data's current uh, innovative in incentive program. Those are all available. A recording of the webinar will be provided in a follow-up email, and please contact us if we can help you at any time. We're going to start off with a poll so we can get a uh, idea of our audience today. And our poll is, what type of organization do you represent? In your console right now, please choose one of the following. You represent a medical device manufacturer. You represent a company that provides software as a medical device. You're a contract manufacturer uh, providing design and development expertise. Uh, your area, your organization is into quality or regulatory or other. We'll give you a just a, another 10, 15 seconds or so. This is very helpful information for us, and we appreciate you providing this uh, during the webinar. It helps us frame our thoughts. All right, so I see that we have um, quite a few responses. I'll give you just a couple more, couple more seconds to respond. And we'll go ahead and close the poll. Thank you all for responding. Um, not many quality or regulatory folks on, but a good even distribution of the other three categories. Um, Angela, I'll ask you to give a brief overview just to, to provide a foundation for today's discussion. Tell us who Mercury Data Science is and what you do. Will do. Thank you for including us in your webinar series, Keith. At Mercury Data Science, we're an AI consultancy and product studio. We work across the full ecosystem of healthcare from research and discovery through uh, digital health, medical devices, and with insurance and payers. We work at the intersection of biology and technology. We bring a multidisciplinary team of data scientists with experience in neuroscience, computational biology, genomics, uh, computer science, and engineering. Very good. Well, I'm excited about today's uh, discussion and your presentation. Um, again, just to provide a foundation for our conversation, I'll briefly touch on uh, the Galen Cloud and who Galen Data is. We provide compliant connectivity for medical devices. The Galen Cloud is a turnkey purpose-built platform for medical devices providing connectivity. The Galen Cloud is compatible with all cloud infrastructures, Amazon Web Services, Azure, et cetera. It is ISO 13485 certified. Uh, the Galen Cloud is also FDA, HIPAA, GDPR compliant. In a nutshell, it is a highly configurable interface for data access and display of data. It provides uh, different levels of access and access control, alerts, online analytics, and much, much more. Uh, here's our overview for today's conversation. So artificial intelligence can be applied in a number of ways to digital health. Today, we're gonna focus on why AI is important for healthcare in the first place, and then move into defining what is artificial intelligence. 
It's got a lot of broad uses. You can't turn on the television these days without seeing an advertisement for some product that has AI under the hood. Uh, and then we'll talk about what are some common AI techniques and use cases specific to medical devices. And then finally, some actionable and hopefully valuable information for our audience, how to get started on your AI journey. So with that, Angela, I will turn it over to you. Wonderful. First, Keith, we're going to talk about the macro landscape of health tech. There is a lot happening in the space. The first thing we start with is data. There is increasingly rich data, more sources than ever, and more of it. We've had for a long time the traditional episodic data contained in EHRs um, that we use to gain insight to health outcomes. We're now more and more getting signal from the text and images that are contained in the PAC systems, as well as the EHR, and from other sources of real world data and information. We are also bringing into that episodic mix information that is continuous. So mobile information that's coming from a myriad of applications, social media is increasingly providing insight and signals into people's lifestyle and health. Video-based information is really evolving right now, particularly with the rapid adoption of telehealth brought on by the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then this audience, what they know well, the sensors and devices, the number of these continue, continues to increase and the number of applications is really exploding. So we've got all of this rich data combined with techniques uh, that are evolving in the, in the tech space, right? So we've got better processing, faster processing than ever, cloud infrastructure, solutions, infrastructure as a service solutions like Galen um, that can really offer the powerful um, environments that we need in healthcare to innovate while also guaranteeing security, privacy, and taking care of regulatory considerations. We've got improved visualization techniques that are coming out all the time that let us look at larger and larger sets of data, gain insights. And of course, our space is the smarter algorithms. We have algorithms coming out practically every week that are enabling us with better tools to get insight that can drive value. So what's happening then is we see this value coming together across the full ecosystem of healthcare, everything from the drug trials and discovery research space, it's improving patient access, a lot of work in preventive and personalized medicine. And of course, we're all working in a more value-based care-driven environment. So the use cases are myriad um, and continue to become more and more interesting and more unique. On the drug trials and discovery front, we're all hearing about the drug discovery work in silico modeling, mining of literature, looking at ways to not only identify new compounds, but find new purposes uh, for existing compounds. Digital biomarkers are a big topic there as well. Uh, patient access, uh, we're looking at a lot of ways through triage chatbots, virtual medical assistance, a lot of personalized monitoring to improve access to patients. Preventive medicine, a lot of this monitoring then is useful in driving alerts around to support early diagnosis and to better manage chronic diseases. In the personalized medicine space, this has been a dream for a while to use not only the longitudinal and deep personal data going all the way back to genetic data through um, people's lifestyle and so forth, as well as learning from the very wide set of data from population trends, as well as research uh, to really optimize treatment on an individual level. So you need machine intelligence to make that a reality. And the value-based care side, it's really algorithms that are driving a lot of the best practices there around more efficiencies, better outcomes, uh, and at lower cost. Uh, so next slide, please, Keith. So what I wanted to emphasize here with my blue box is that we often think about medical devices, and when I, I'm speaking about medical devices broadly, whether they're a physical device or software as a medical device, we think about that pretty naturally in patient access and in preventive and personalized medicine. Um, but I do want to emphasize the role of medical devices, in particular also in drug discovery, with the extreme cost and long timeline to bring new drugs to market. There's a lot of opportunity here to apply these medical devices as digital biomarkers to help the drug companies identify early on uh, the candidates that have the most chance of success and also identify earlier uh, risk endpoints um, for uh, for those drug pipelines. Um, so that's one area when we meet with medical device companies, we're always thinking about how can we think about other use cases outside of the traditional clinical and consumer cases. Next, Keith. So clearly a lot of value is being delivered um, in the space and there's a lot more potential coming. The investors have taken note. So this is a, from a report out of CB Insights showing that 2019 was a record year for investment into AI startups at 26.6 billion. 
across all industries, healthcare topped, topped them all with $4 billion in investment in 2019. Next up was financial and insurance at 2.2 billion. Retail and consumer product goods was at one and a half billion. So that also showed a real bump for healthcare over the 2018 investment of 2.7 billion. So the investment is really ramping up. So with this kind of capital market, uh, the current economic climate, uh, notwithstanding the investments are continuing in health, there's a lot of um, a lot of innovation is coming in the space. So what is AI that is has the potential, is already adding value and has the potential to add even more? So when we think about AI, we think about a diverse field of many techniques. So this diagram on the right, you, you can find a lot of diagrams out there, kind of like this one. Uh, there's many ways to look at it, but we think about this collection of algorithms in some high level groups. So machine learning, natural language processing, Expert systems sometimes doesn't often come into our work. Vision-based systems do often. Speech-based systems, very relevant. Planning and logistics uh, is something that a lot of hospitals are considering. And then of course, robotics do come into some uh, care opportunities there. Um, so when we think about AI strategy, which is what we often work on with our clients, we are usually looking at existing software. So we're looking at using pre-trained algorithms as much as possible. We never recommend uh, reinventing the wheel. So our work always begins with um, a research, uh, sort of a, a look across the landscape at what's been published, what's known, what have people had success with, what have they not, and among our own team, because we bring a lot of diverse experiences both in our company and outside of it uh, with our background. So that's really a value in bringing a multidisciplinary perspective. The approaches that we use are always specific to the use case and the data. So clearly you can see by these categories, if you're looking at unstructured text, natural language processing is gonna be a factor. Um, if you, particularly in health, even if you have structured data that you're training models against, transparency and explainability of the model is very important. So that can drive our decisions between deep learning versus more traditional supervised or unsupervised machine learning techniques. Um, we often combine techniques. So a good example here, we do um, a decent amount of work in video analytics at Mercury Data Science. Um, and video is a multimodal technique that requires us to use speech-based processing so that we can convert what people say into words. We can then use natural language processing on those words. We use computer vision to understand what people's faces are doing and other techniques in time series analytics to understand what's happening with someone's voice. Um, so we often combine techniques. We're always considering infrastructure and deployment. Uh, you need to think about as you are preparing a model to go into production, how are you gonna learn from new data as it comes in? What's gonna be your strategy as algorithms evolve? Um, and so that's a, a big piece of the strategy that, that we work through. So what do we most commonly see in the medical device space? Uh, we kind of break that down into four categories. So clustering techniques that are unsupervised techniques. So that's where we have a set of data. There's not necessarily a right answer, so it's not labeled data, but we're looking at trying to understand are there divisions in the data? Did certain groups of patients, did they experience different um, courses of a disease? Can we explain why? Do we see commonality? Um, were there consistent responses to a drug? Uh, we also do a lot of classification work. This is most commonly applied in images. So in image studies, you have a set of labeled data, for instance, a set of images that contain tumors, a set of images that do not contain tumors that are healthy, and you're trying to generate a prediction for a new image, uh, which to which category does this belong? Um, you also can do that with time series signals uh, to say, does this signal represent early disease onset or not? So you're really trying to arrive at a diagnosis, at a, at a yes, no kind of answer. Um, we also do a lot of regression work. So regression is where you're trying to predict um, a number, something like uh, if you know a biomarker about a, a given um, oncology patient, can you predict survival? for that patient so that you can shape treatment decisions. Um, if you have information about a device, can you predict when that device might fail? So you might trigger some kind of advanced um, intervention to replace it or update the power source or so forth. Um, the illustration there is showing a linear regression. Most health data is nonlinear. So decision trees are often a tool that we use in that space. Um, and it's also very common for us to combine these techniques, as I mentioned on the, on the other slide. Sometimes classification problems turn into regression problems in healthcare in particular. Um, sometimes it's not helpful to just get a yes or no answer of um, the likelihood of a patient experiencing a, a, an adverse event, for example. You want to see a probability so that you can decide which patients should, should get early intervention or not. So it's not always clear cut which technique we apply to which data. 
Natural language processing in the medical device space, it's often something that we are doing to structure data to prepare it for modeling. Um, so oftentimes we're training NLP, using NLP extractions on clinical data that is unstructured. Maybe we're trying to extract labels to indicate which patients had a particular um, comorbidity or diagnosis so that we can then use that to train models. Um, but also there's a, a big amount of work here in intelligent chatbots and precision medicine. How do you really bring insights from research literature and bring that to the point of care? Next up, please. Oh, I don't great, know. Uh, great introduction. Um, you know, my takeaway and what you've uh, discussed so far, Angela, is that AI, while, while it may be two letters, it is so broad based. Uh, there's a lot of so many different approaches, so many different applications that we'll get into. Uh, but we'll get into that after we take another poll here. And so let's go ahead and launch that poll. And the poll is, what is your AI outlook? Uh, you have artificial intelligence, data analytics, machine learning already implemented or well underway in development. Uh, number two, you're definitely planning on AI, but you have not taken any definitive action yet. Number three, you're not sure if AI presents an opportunity or not for you, uh, and we'll help you with that throughout the, uh, the rest of the webinar. Or number four, you just don't feel you're a good candidate for the application of artificial intelligence. I see the answers are coming in. So I give you guys just another five, five or 10 seconds or so to give us your, your opinion on what your outlook toward AI is. Very good, just about everybody's participated. And we'll go ahead and close the poll. And um, pretty much everybody falls one of the first two categories. You're implementing AI or you're planning on it, you're gonna do it, no action yet. Uh, a few in that third category. But uh, pretty much as we expected, very good. Angela, I know that when you and I were uh, preparing for this webinar over the past few weeks, you shared with me a lot of uh, use cases, case studies, uh, examples and applications that you've had a direct hand in. We're going to take some time now. I'm going to ask you to share some of those uh, anecdotes and, and case studies with our audience. Yeah, happy to you, Keith. So this is some work that we've done at Mercury Data Science, and I thought these could be sort of illustrative for the audience to understand how techniques can be applied. So the first one is a client of ours that's working in the neurospace, and they were going to be training models um, using brain MRIs, and they were looking for a digital biomarker to, um, to indicate presence of a, a particular disease. So they came to us uh, because they were going to be assimilating large sets of imaging studies from many different sources, some public, some uh, commercial partnerships. And one of the challenges is that the image quality was, gonna, was varying significantly across all of these studies. So this is a case where we needed to help with an automated QA approach, even before the modeling, to be able to assess these thousands of images and identify which ones met the quality bar to be considered for modeling or not. So this is a great example where AI techniques can be applied even in the case of preparing the data before you start modeling. So in this case, I think we hit about 90% accuracy. Uh, we did end up labeling a set of data among our team so that we could train models against on which, which images uh, met those quality bars and which didn't. Uh, so this client now is moving on to start uh, the model training based on the high quality data that we've identified. Next up is a medical device company that we work with. They um, are they have a device that is capable of differentiating um, cancer versus not cancer based on a biopsy sample. Uh, they came to us with help uh, evaluating the signal coming out of the device to identify the best way to recognize those patterns. So we had labeled data from a clinical trial. Um, this one is a good one because the, the client was pretty sure a good amount of their data was too noisy, that, that the signal to noise ratio was too low, and they gave us instructions to filter out a good amount of data from their first trial. We uh, like to let the data speak for itself, so we did our own experiments and we were able to expand, open up those filters and use a lot more of the data than they expected us to. And we were able to increase the accuracy of our models between five and 10%, depending on the technique, by using that additional data. So um, in this case, the work is ongoing, more trials are planned. Um, we'll eventually seek regulatory approval. There's also a chance to not only influence a diagnosis, 
but also identify the histological subtype and shape precision medicine decisions there. So really hopeful work there. Um, next up is video analytics. This is a client who um, is bringing new drugs to market, uh, specifically for depression, so in the neuro, neuro behavior space. They need a better way to diagnose depression. The current gold standard is um, clinical inventories where patients ask questions and depending on their scoring, they're, they're defined, diagnosed as depressed or not. Um, this is an expensive way and an, an infrequent way to manage cases of depression requiring um, an expert to administer it. So we worked with them to design a new application that could capture answers to some of these same clinical inventory questions as well as more through a mobile application to capture a video. And then we trained multimodal models on what the person's face looked like when they were talking. Was their voice, was their inflection, was it flat? Um, and then what kinds of words did they use? What was the sentiment of those words? Um, and so we use natural language processing, speech to text um, translation as well as natural language processing to arrive at a much more uh, rich and nuanced answer, um, not only depressed, but uh, the, the severity. So this opens up patient access because you can assess this with much more frequency. And then in the trial, there's a hope that you could use this also to gauge response to the medication and thereby provide a stronger signal um, to this industry on, on how best to get, get these drugs uh, that, that potentially can help out, out and approved. Next up, Keith, I've got three more I was gonna talk through. Uh, another one is a video analytics. So this client uh, needed to assess cognitive performance and they wanted to work with us to see about the feasibility of using biometric eye tracking. So they wanted to be able to assess cognitive performance in real time from a mobile app um, in cases of concussion, cognitive decline, such as Alzheimer's as well. Um, as intoxication. Uh, so in this case, we worked with them to design a study to capture the behavior, design an application as well that could capture behavior for healthy participants of what normal eye tracking looks like. And then uh, we helped them build the models that could then detect deviations from that that would indicate um, a cognitive problem. So uh, this work is ongoing, it's been deployed, it is working real time, um, and this company has raised their next round of funding and is moving on. So we're really happy with that early partnership. Next up is bioinformatics work. Uh, so in this case, we work with an agricultural biotech client that is finding targets of gene engineering to improve uh, food crops. So we do two things for them. We do the genomic um, wide association studies, the GWAS, to look for statistically significant um, variants in the, in the genomes of plants to try to recommend targets for gene engineering. The next thing that we do here is in the natural language processing side, as soon as we turn up something interesting from the genomic analysis, we need to provide rapid insight into what's been learned over the last you know, three decades of plant research. Has this been studied before? Has it been tried? Is it known? Is it novel, uh, that insight? Which is similar to the last case study here. We work with a client um, who is identifying drug targets in the oncology space. Uh, so they have a 3D tumor model. Um, they are rapidly identifying these targets and working with partners to identify and prioritize the best ones to move forward in their pipelines. In this case, then, they need to know from the millions of published articles, uh, when they find a new target, is this novel? Has it been the subject of patent activity? Has it shown promise in previous research studies? Um, and then they can use that information to prioritize the next steps between them and their partners. So the AI journey, I think uh, everyone uh, realizes that there's value here, that there are um, very innovative solutions where you can use data to drive insights and create entirely, support entirely new use cases that, that don't currently exist. So how do you get started? Um, it sounds like a lot of you are on this journey. So this is a, um, a fairly popular AI methodology, the CPM AI, Cognitive Project Management for AI methodology. So there's arrows going everywhere. I think what I want you to take away from this is that data is at the center. So all of these AI projects revolve around the data. Um, these projects are not linear. So if you've worked in other software engineering projects in the past, generally um, what you can envision, what you can design is largely possible and it tends to be very linear and you can largely predict how much effort's required and how long it's going to take. AI projects are very different. They're very iterative. Um, you're constantly reevaluating what will the data support and what does the business need, and you're trying to find overlap. Um, so this kind of work requires much more partnership between the business and the tech teams than a traditional project, than a traditional software development project. So knowing that this process is very nonlinear, it's very iterative, how do you get started? So start with your data asset. 
make sure that you are storing and saving all of your data, even if you think it's noisy, even if you're not sure about the quality, make sure that you have rights to use this data. We um, have a good amount of experience working with companies. Uh, it can be tricky now when you're running trials and so forth to make sure you get access to all the data that you need that surrounds your device um, as, and your algorithm and to make sure that you get those rights. So we're always happy to talk about that offline, uh, but that's key and foundational and essential. Next up is make sure you understand your stakeholders. Healthcare has the most complicated stakeholder landscape of any industry. Um, so make sure that you're thinking about all dimensions of that stakeholder, who's gonna use the software, uh, both the patient and the provider, who's gonna purchase it, if that involves um, a hospital, if it's going to be funded by payers, make sure you think about all dimensions of that. Um, particularly if you're introducing new workflows, make sure that you've got buy-in. We, uh, When we've seen AI projects fail, generally it's because people are running science experiments and it's not, the work is not being done in the context of what the business really needs. Uh, next up is if you're ready, you understand your business, you've got a data set, start characterizing that data. Make sure you understand what noise is there, what kind of bias is there, um, you know, how, how generalizable is the data set that you've got compared to the real kind of everyday world? Um, where do you have data that's missing? There's a lot of external data sets available. That's another area that we work with clients pretty often is identifying what sources of data, both public and private, could be used to augment the data set um, that a client currently has. And then you're gonna want to assess feasibility. So start doing modeling, experiment with different strategies and techniques, see where you can get the best results, see what you learn, what signal that gives you about what additional data you might need, where to go from here, use that to inform future trials or data collection efforts. And then hopefully you come out of that phase with some feasibility. You've identified a use case that you can support right now with the acceptable accuracy level. Um, you can really think about your specificity and sensitivity. Um, this is a big one, of course, in the health space. Um, one area that we particularly work on is the bias that we have in training data. So um, if you're collecting data from a healthy population, you are, uh, you know, maybe 99% of your cases of a healthy behavior, 1%. Um, is disease behavior, you need to be careful because a model that predicts healthy every time is going to be 99% accurate and of course add zero value. So there's a lot of extra um, analysis that we do in health applications, especially preparing for regulatory considerations. And then at that point, you're ready to consider how do you deploy and maintain the solution. And this is like one item number six, but it's a big one, of course. Usability considerations are important, full stack software, um, and then how are you gonna evolve this model over time? The regulatory landscape is evolving there uh, to support these considerations of, of retraining models um, as you collect more data. So that we expect that to, to come along and give us all better insight into, into, that, uh, into those considerations. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll take my orange box now, Keith. Thank you. So Sorry. what I wanted to emphasize, no, you're good. What I wanted to emphasize here is that we call this a lighthouse project. And this is a very common way that we engage with new clients. So um, a, a lot of times clients will come to us when they have a data set. And you know, in health, data sets tend to be small. So that's one of the common things that uh, we deal with when you work in finance and retail. It's common to have data sets of, with millions of rows in healthcare. A few hundred is common in the early days. Maybe you'll get to thousands or tens of thousands at some point. Um, and so how do you do a lighthouse project early on to understand your stakeholders, to characterize the data that you have now and understand the feasibility? So we would always recommend doing this kind of an effort, ensuring that you've got buy-in, ensuring that you're hitting your thresholds for accuracy and other considerations uh, before you move into production planning. And then finally, I will wrap up by sharing uh, just some of the insights that hopefully you've taken away. So data is an extremely valuable asset. Store it, treat it as an asset, uh, make sure that you carefully maintain your, um, your rights to the, your license to that data. Always look for ways to augment it and add to it. Uh, more is better. So the anecdote I shared where the client thought a lot of their data was, um, was too noisy for use and they were wrong. So let a real data scientist make the call on what data can be used. Um, always know that your data can be combined. There's a lot of options here. So an example there that we've done work on is just around zip codes. So if you um, have clinical trial participants or other uh, people providing data to you, if you have a zip code that can give you great insight uh, through census data and other things to bring in demographics and, and insights to the social determinants of health, which are increasingly important. Uh, like I talked about in video analytics, multimodal matters. So if you do have the opportunity to uh, capture video, 
audio, social media, any other dimensions of data to go along with the work that you're doing. Um, there's a lot of interesting work here. Twitter feeds have been shown um, to be associated with cardiovascular risk. Certain Instagram filters, particularly the ones that drain color from photos, have been associated to depression. There is an early study out that's suggesting that it's possible to detect in voice uh, asymptomatic COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, so that uh, is very interesting. I think there's Fitbit data coming out saying that um, the accelerating heart rate uh, that they can detect potentially nine days before a viral infection, before normal symptoms appear. So there's an incredible amount of information in this uh, of human behavior in, in this multimodal data. Um, as I discussed with natural language processing, sometimes you need to use AI to prepare the data even before you start modeling. So if you're concerned about your data quality, uh, just know that there's a lot of techniques that we can do. So for example, the QA work we did on the uh, brain MRI images I discussed earlier, um, unstructured data, we had a client approach us recently and they had a, an extremely large set of claims data um, and outcomes and they were looking at insight, could you predict at the outset um, of an injury or workers' comp situation, can you predict an outcome, what likely costs are going to be incurred and timeline? Um, so because the data was almost exclusively unstructured, the very first thing we had to do was go to work on the natural language processing side to create structure. And in the end, um, we got very high accuracy models to predict insights to that. So I guess even if your data is messy, don't assume that there's not value there. Um, and then training data is very valuable. So these algorithms are evolving constantly. There's more techniques, there's better um, processors that can uh, attempt more techniques um, in less time, better cloud solutions. So if you have the data and you have the rights to the data, that trumps everything, assuming you have a good data science team. Uh, so make sure that, that, that the training data, um, you keep it, protect it. Um, and then the last thing is just know that data can support new business models and new kinds of customers. This is an area when we work with Lighthouse Projects, uh, with many of our clients, that's a lot of our discussions is really looking at the signal that the data is there based on work that we've done, throwing out ideas for other ways that the data can be used, other um, users, as I mentioned earlier, a common one with medical devices is looking at the use cases of pharma. Um, that is something that we uh, spend time talking to people about and making connections and, and so forth. Uh, so hopefully that's helpful to you. We're always happy. I would say we meet with a new company uh, probably every week or every two weeks. It's always beneficial to us to have a meeting. We learn something every time. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out if you would uh, like to have input from our team. Thanks, Keith. So Angela, it seems to me like it's a little bit more than just putting your data in Excel and using the linear regression function. You are correct. A little bit more to it than that. Wow, this is this is fantastic. Uh, you you covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time in a very clear manner, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, you had a, a couple slides on uh, how to get started. Let me leave our audience before we get to our Q and A session with what you and I suggest the next steps are for our audience. Number one, think about your device data. Is there potential, any potential at all, based on what you've learned today, for artificial intelligence to create business opportunities? Number two, specific to the wonderful use cases you shared, Angela, uh, is there any similarity between those use cases and your medical device with your target market? And then number three, I would encourage everybody to view these first two questions from, from a very broad viewpoint collecting and analyzing data from all your deployed devices via the cloud, not just from a single device. There's often power in that broad data collection as you touched on uh, today. And don't forget that when we talk about medical device data, we're not just talking about the vital signs, the patient measurements, the physiological data. We're also talking about data and information that characterizes the device itself battery level, onboard diagnostics, can AI perhaps lead to a check engine light for your individual medical devices? And then number four, let us know if Galen Data or Mercury Data Science can help you. So with that, um, I would like to make one announcement before we go to our Q&A, and that is uh, the Galen Cloud Incentive Program. Uh, we haven't touched a whole lot on cloud connectivity. We have in past webinars. You can go to our website, galendata.com, and see a recording of our past webinars. Uh, but we've got an incentive program that allows you, in a very cost-effective manner, to determine if the Galen Cloud meets your needs. We will provide to you a fully op operational Galen Cloud environment 
at no cost for up to two months. You must meet certain technical and administrative requirements. The program eligibility period ends at the end of August, so about five weeks from now. If you are interested at all, would like to find out more, please email us at incentive at galendata.com. And the marketing slick that you see on the screen, you can download that now from the handouts area in your console. Angela, uh, before we go to our Q&A, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, I would say um, I think there's real value in working with a kind of a full stack team when you are iterating on these strategies. So don't hesitate to reach out to us or to other I don't really know any other teams that are similar to us, but if you find another one, um, I think getting that breadth of perspective on what's possible, really getting a lot of insight on your strategy, um, thinking carefully and strategically about um, how you evolve your data set, um, how you deploy your device, um, how you negotiate your contracts. I think these are all really important considerations when companies are starting on, on this path. Very good. Very good final words of wisdom. Uh, all right, so time for our Q&A. We've got a lot of questions that have come in so far. Um, you can submit your questions in the uh, window in the console. Uh, recording, I'll remind everybody, recording of the webinar will be provided via email after the webinar completes. And uh, Angela, here's our first question. My medical device outputs several vital signs, such as heart rate, heart rate variability, and body temperature to monitor certain heart conditions. We have a complex set of thresholds and alarm conditions, but what else could we do with analytics and artificial intelligence? Yeah, that's a great question, Keith. So I mentioned one insight is to consider the pharma, um, the pharma needs there. Can, can these signals not only detect some kind of a heart condition, but can they also look for early signs of adverse events in trials? Um, and you know, really consider how you might drive a research and discovery pipeline around that as well, in addition to the clinical use case. I also would like to take this moment to introduce my colleague, um, one of our lead data scientists, Jonathan Gallian. So Jonathan has a PhD in computational biology from the Baylor College of Medicine, um, and he has a lot of experience working with us in, in many use cases. He was able to join today uh, to help with some of these questions. So I would love to give Jonathan the opportunity, if he's with us, uh, to weigh in on, on some techniques he might consider. Yeah, Jonathan, thanks for the introduction. I, I am. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Angela. I, I do really like this question, and, and hello, everybody. I like this question because it really drives to the heart of of data science. I think everyone thinks of data science as the modeling and creating this brilliant model that you can just take your data and plug it in and it, and it cranks out an answer. I think the majority of our time is really spent on feature creation. So you can have an initial, initial set of features and then build additional features on top of that. So for instance, with this question, you can start thinking about pattern recognition, um, combining features to identify specific states that can then be correlated to uh, the disease in this case, or, or just some sort of output. So you can think of how something changes over time, internal internal normalization, uh, clustering, where you take, okay, so a, a person has a spike in a heart rate for 24, for 24 minutes. That likely is going to correlate to something like exercise, and you can start looking at how these things over time can actually correlate to your end Y variable. So I think feature creation is essential with any data science project and, and where a majority of the bulk should be spent. Very good, very good. Um, oh, here's a question. One of your earlier slides, let's repeat this question, Angela. It reads, will implementing AI now at an early stage in our company be attractive to potential investors? Yeah, that's always important for early stage companies. The capital investments are definitely definitely needed to power this kind of innovation. We have also from uh, on the line our CEO of Mercury Data Science is Dan Watkins, and he is also a partner in the Mercury Fund. Uh, for those who don't know, we launched out of the Mercury Fund at Mercury Data Science, and the Mercury Fund is the largest investor of uh, Series A SaaS tech companies. So I think, Dan, if you are able to field that one as an investor, I think you're the, the perfect person to answer. Sure, happy to answer. The, uh, um, the, the answer is maybe. Uh, every, the AI label's been put on everything, so VCs have seen that play, and you have to go deeper and show that you can have an advantage. But if you can have an advantage in 
uh, demonstrating uh, superior performance, uh, lower cost of clinical trials or faster trials, uh, expanded market size, uh, perhaps by adding a recurring revenue stream. Uh, that matters. And you don't necessarily, I don't think as an early stage company, you have to have uh, it, it totally completely implemented, but you have to have some signal and show that it can be, uh, is, a, is sort of on, in the roadmap. Um, and be, remember, if you can, if you're thinking about it, your competitors are also thinking about it. So in some cases, it's a competitive necessity to uh, to be, basically make the most of the data that your uh, device is putting out. Very good, very good. Thank you, Dan. Uh, here's a good one. Does the data sample requirement change from the type of AI technique that's being provided, such as supervised versus unsupervised? Yeah, that's a question. It definitely, uh, I'll add my insights and I'm happy for Jonathan to weigh in as well if he would like to. So yeah, supervised uh, methods require that we have labeled data. So we have a set of data to train on where we know the answer, we know the outcome, we know if the image contains a tumor or it doesn't, we know if the biopsy resulted in a cancer diagnosis or not. Um, so we uh, are dependent on those data sets. I'll say also, while we're talking about it, getting labeled data sets and that helps uh, many cases, the label data sets we're using are coming from, depending on the use case, they're coming, it's a, if it's a diagnosis, it's coming from a, a physician, maybe a radiologist, maybe a pathologist. Humans, of course, are not perfect, so we also have to do um, a good amount of analysis to understand the quality of the label data that we have. It's always best in if you have the ability to control a clinical trial when you're collecting data, if you can get second and third opinions uh, with one case that we work with now, we were able to get three pathologists to weigh in on a particular diagnosis, and then we take the two out of the three as, um, as the guiding principle there. Uh, so yes, and then unsupervised techniques do not require uh, any kind of labeling. Um, we're then just looking for patterns in the data. Jonathan, please feel free if you want to weigh in anything else there. That's a great summary. It, it is absolutely project specific and problem specific. It really comes down to a few things. So, so problem complexity, of course, is going to drastically dictate the number of samples necessary. You see this often when we're looking at personalized medicine. If you have a mutation, say, for instance, BRCA2, that occurs fairly frequently, you need fewer patients in order to, to designate, to identify that signal. Now, if you're trying to find rare drivers, you need a far greater number of, of samples in order to, to quantify that. Uh, feature complexity. So if you have a hundred people in your clinical trial and you have a thousand different features, uh, the problem there becomes overfitting so that you can use those features and make something fit, but that's not going to be reliable in the future. So when you're thinking about it's, it's application specific, it's problem specific. If you're thinking about trying to define something that is guaranteed to work in the future, you want to split your data into training set, testing set, validation set to be the most robust. So right there, you start losing the, the quantity of data if you're only able to use 80% of that in your training set. So more is always better in this case. That's not to say that with smaller data sets, you can still find signal and you can be clever in the way that you engineer features in order to make that reliable and to create a robust model. Uh, but it is problem specific and uh, I, I think more is always better, but there are ways around that. Very good, thank you. Um, next question, good one here. Um, for AI medical device challenges, I know AI is in my future, I just don't know when, but should I hire a consultant or begin building my own team? Uh, that's a good question. Well, you're, you're gonna wanna do both, ideally. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we often get involved early with companies um, and the advantage we can bring is we do have a cross-disciplinary team that has seen many similar challenges in the past. We've learned uh, by working with a lot of these techniques, um, which ones work well, which ones have challenges. We have a gut instinct, if you will, about data set sizes and which techniques are gonna be applicable. We have a working knowledge of the landscape of how to augment data. Um, and so what we can often do in a lighthouse project is get a rapid, um, evaluation of feasibility to get a company started on their roadmap. Um, and so what often happens out of our lighthouse projects is we then can weigh in that, and 
I think so far, 100%, we've landed on at least some use case that we felt like was ready to move forward into a production use case. Um, and then we're able to help the companies figure out how to hire a data science team. Um, we find that's a challenge. If you are not a data scientist, how do you identify who is going to be a good data scientist for your company? So we um, get engaged at different levels. And in some cases, we have helped uh, our clients write job descriptions based on what we've learned about their use cases and their data. Um, we um, have gone through applicants and helped them put together their top 10 list. We will do the tech interviews and tech screens uh, to help guide them, applying the same techniques that we use in building our own team. Um, so we're, we're a good early partner for that. Angela, you've touched on partially the answer to the, the next question as a follow on. How much data does a company need to have before starting a lighthouse project with Mercury Data Science? Yeah, that is very problem system. You want to you continue on that topic? Yeah, I think to answer this one, it helps to know that. So oftentimes the way we'll engage is we'll have a few discussions early, early on um, so we can get a sense and I mean, those are no risk. It's, it's really just getting a sense of what your data is, what that looks like. And then we can make a recommendation of, OK, this is the data you need to collect. This is enough to move forward with. I think casual conversations are a great, great way to explore this. Uh, I, I can't really give you a concrete number of you need this many data points or this many features to this many data points. There is a threshold where before that, it's just not worth engaging because the quality of the data model you're going to get out of it, it just isn't going to be as subjective. That being said, there are low hanging fruit in many cases where you can start getting insight immediately and that can be incorporated into the business model. Even if it isn't your final objective, even if it isn't the final model, you can start learning initially. But I think meeting with a data scientist and just having like a casual conversation about what you have, what you need and the business objective, I think that's the best way to approach that. Very good. We're gonna we're gonna take a bit of a, a turn here and talk about regulatory. The next couple of questions. The first one is, can you speak to the FDA's guidance with regard to artificial intelligence as it relates to clinical decision support and other use cases? What's the FDA's view on AI? Yeah, Dan, would you like to weigh in on on your take on this? Yeah, the the. Uh... The traditional thinking is that you essentially are freezing your product when you get develop you you uh, get it approved and an approved product if you if you make significant changes to it you would have to go back. So under traditional, I guess existing regulations, uh, you know our understanding is you would have to go back and redo another trial with a new algorithm. For instance, if you have an algorithm embedded into your your system and device and you it in it trains and improves as you get more data then you might would have in, under the historic rules you would have to go back and get approval for that new uh solution that the algorithm provided however the um fda is perfectly aware of how ai works and has issued guidance over the last few years that indicates that they're working towards a specification that will allow you to have training algorithms and what it will really mandate are quality systems around how you handle the data, how you assess the, uh, the functioning of the algorithm and how you test it before you actually uh, launch it into the device. Um, so I think that if you have a, a situation where software is a, is a part of a, a regulated product, uh, I think you can feel pretty, pretty safe that in the next couple of years, uh, the, the idea of a, uh, a, a changing and learning algorithm will be incorporated into the FDA uh, uh, guidance. Dan, as a follow-on, thank you for that. Uh, as a follow-on, do your clients claim your algorithms, the algorithms that MDS would develop, as a software, as a medical device? I, I, would, say, I would say that the majority of, of our clients are not in that situation. Uh, we, do, we, do have, we do have one that is, is probably will be um, incorporating it into the regulatory process, but uh, but many of these are, uh, you know, if you're using it to, uh, if not for clinical decision, but just, uh, you know, just increased information um, or to provide a, uh, um, uh, to provide the, uh, the, the, the patient some additional information, you don't, typically don't have that. Now, I think you need to talk to a regulatory consultant about the specific case, but I would say um, many of our patients, it isn't, is not regulated. 
Very good. Um, oh, another good question relating to data collection, but for clinical trials. The question reads, when you're thinking about your clinical trial, what is the best way to think about how broad to go with your data collection? Yeah, that's a good one. Definitely uh, a number of companies to talk through what their data collection strategy is gonna be as part of their trial. This is, it's hard. We're gonna say more data is always better, um, but of course that is gonna drive up expense and complexity uh, the more that you ask for. Um, hospitals often are not always well suited to provide you kind of with feeds of all of the data just for a trial. Um, so I don't have a hard answer on this, of course, it's gonna depend on the situation. I'm gonna stick with my original, the more is better. Uh, the more that you can have about a particular patient, their um, their history, their comorbidities, uh, details about, um, in the case where I've worked in digital health and software as a medical device, uh, everything that you can get is helpful, right? If you can get lab values, you can understand prescription med profiles, uh, all of it, and then all, all the treatments being administered and um, longer term outcomes. Angel, I'll echo that, you know, data storage is cheap, um, terabytes is cheap. The cost of collecting data, though, is in the, the documentation, the controls of the data. But if you have the resources for those administrative functions, then yes, collect as much as you can, as often as you can, even if, you, even if you're not sure whether it's going to be a value or not. If it's cost affordable to, to collect it, then do. And engage someone like Mercury Data Science to help make that determination of the value proposition. Yeah, I see. Uh, I can jump in. Oh, sorry, not to interrupt either of you. Uh, just to jump in, the two thoughts that I have when we've helped our clients in the past, the first is hypothesis generation early on. So what what do you expect to find and what pieces of information can help speak to that? So a very focused idea of what's useful and then move maybe move that out one rung. So look at what what's essential and then what's the secondary things that might be able to help you get to that. The second one is data sparsity. So even though you're collecting data, or trying to collect a specific feature, that may not be available for every participant. That may not be something they wanna provide. So if they're gonna opt out and you're spending money to collect that and 90% of your data is going to be missing that, then it's probably not worth your investment early on. Uh, but again, just to, to mirror what Angela is saying, you don't know some of that early on, so if you can collect it, but otherwise, I think those are the two things that I would focus on early on. Very good. We've got a couple more questions that have come in before we wrap up. Um, question reads, I'm curious if there are any particular challenges or insights that you found that could drive design choices for device hardware and subsequently for collection, especially cloud infrastructure. Are there any emerging trends of such as preferred storage strategies or considerations for sensor tuning to maximize data asset value down the line. Uh, before I turn it over to you and your, you, Angela, and your team, I will say that the, the Galen Cloud, this is part of it being purpose built for medical device connectivity. The fact that it is uh, very turnkey as far as collecting a broad set of data values from a large number of medical devices for analytic use. That was one of the design considerations when we built the data cloud, uh, Galen Cloud, several years ago. And it's a feature that many of our clients enjoy today. Uh, but Angela, back over to you for any thoughts in answering this question. Yeah, I'll add a couple of thoughts and then I'll be glad to have Jonathan weigh in as well. When you're looking at devices, particularly that are time series based, it's always a challenge and it's a cost issue. How much, with what frequency do you load to the cloud? Uh, our advice is gonna be capture the highest frequency that you can in the early days until modeling can happen to really understand at what elements of aggregation are gonna give you that right balance between uh, capturing the signal that you need, um, and you know, to remove cost and sort of bandwidth considerations. We've done some work. Uh, occasionally, we take on projects outside of health if, um, if it's going to help us build our skills to help um, you know advance health. Because as you can imagine, a lot of algorithms get pioneered in other industries that are less regulated, less critical. Um, so we have done work in the IoT space, and that is a challenge there. Also, um, particularly in spaces that uh, don't have high bandwidth connectivity. Um, and there's options for, you know, edge, deploying edge models and so forth. So I think all of that depends on the device, the type of data being collected, how it's being streamed. Is it inpatient? Is it 
um, outpatient, kind of all the, the use cases. Uh, Jonathan, I'd be glad for you to weigh in on any, any of your experiences. No, I think you had a great summary. It is very use case specific. Uh, I think you need to know how you want to use this in the future and start thinking about that early. Uh, and that sounds like what, exactly what's happening here. HIPAA compliance, um, even when you're thinking about hiring data scientists, it comes down to how many data scientists are going to have expertise within that platform to understand it. It's going to be harder to find someone with a more specialty or boutique cloud service. Um, when you think about model deployment, some models are already made accessible and they're a model marketplace. So if there are models already existing for your specific use case, that might be something that might uh, bring you towards a specific platform. I don't have a specific recommendation. It is specific, uh, but I definitely think about it early and, and think about where you're going in the future so that it matches your vision uh, rather than just so your, your immediate needs. Do you all see any place, next question, do you all see any place for domain expertise in developing AI models? Absolutely. Um, you know, we attended the JP Morgan Health Conference in January, and I, I think every talk that I went to had the same theme. Health AI is struggling right now because you need people that have domain expertise um, in life sciences combined with AI domain expertise, and it's really difficult to find those people. So some of the workarounds are, can you at least create cross-functional teams? So you have your uh, health domain, your biologists, your physicians, et cetera, working hand in hand with your AI uh, expertise people. We, of course, try to hire as much as we can people with expertise in both. We find it's really, um, it's necessary in the use cases that we tackle to have a solid understanding of biology, genomics, um, clinical medicine, uh, clinical data. There's a lot of expertise that you have to have to really understand the context of what you're working with. Also understanding the criticality of what you're dealing with. What is the consequence of a model that um, looks great in terms of an AUC, but is not great in terms of sensitivity and specificity. There's real world implications to that. And I think you need some domain expertise in the space to really grasp the significance uh, of some of those choices. I think another factor, particularly on the health side, is if you're trying to pull data out of an EHR, for example, the more data that you need, the more expensive it's gonna be to operationalize that. So how do you, um, you know, use Occam's principle to get the leanest model that you can and balance that, keeping it simple while um, really driving the signal that you need for your use case. So uh, yeah, Jonathan, happy, happy for you to weigh in as well. Again, it's a great, the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, it's essential. Machine learning is, is, is necessary, but you can't get insight from results and you can't get insight in troubleshooting or feature engineering without that domain knowledge. There has to be this interface between the two. And I think we're in a, in a very interesting time where you have domain experts in a very specialized field. And when you bring them together, you don't need to know everything. And you can say, and you can, Oh, sorry, I was hearing feedback. And, and in that merger of the domain expertise, you can get very interesting results. Um, I think it's a very interesting time to be alive for, for machine learning, but the answer is yes, absolutely. Domain knowledge is essential. And that takes us to our last question. I'm gonna add to it. Uh, the, the audience member asks, how fast is the technology changing? And I'm gonna add, and how the heck do you guys at Mercury Data Science keep up? You know, we, we do, uh, so the technology is changing very fast. Uh, so we are, we have a great team. Um, we are a super open team. So we are constantly sharing papers and articles um, on our internal messaging boards. Uh, we invite guest speakers very regularly. So we keep our recruiting pipeline very active. We have a lot of contacts in academia and particularly because that's where usually they're pushing the envelope. So we invite guest speakers. Uh, we bring in academic consultants into our company is a pretty common model. So if there's a particular area where we don't have as much expertise as we would like, that's something that we can do is reach out, bring in an expert to help weigh in on an early strategy. Um, and uh, yeah, that, it's, a, it's a lot of that, but yeah, it is, it's a lot to stay on, on top of. Jonathan, any other, any other tips or tricks you wanna share? No, that, that was a great answer. Uh, I, I, yes, I'll tell, yes to all that. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, before we wrap, I will, I will note uh, there is a typo in the phone number for Galen Data. It's 346-301, not 310. So if you've screen captured or written our phone number down, it's 346 301 0399. 
Uh, that is the last of our questions. I'd like to thank Angela Holmes and her team from Mercury Data Science for a very engaging discussion. And, and thanks to our audience as well for attending today's webinar and for your insightful questions. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future Galen Data webinar. And please let us here at Galen Data or our folks at uh, our team members, our partners at Mercury Data Science, know if there's anything that either of us can do to help you before then. Thank you again and goodbye.